just quickly one. This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Um, so, um, so this is very quick. Just open um, Apollo, and um, I've chosen now Aspergillus fumigatus, um, a fungal genome, which also has quite a lot of annotations. So, if you're interested in those annotations, you can download that. Um, and I've showed you these different um, tabs here on top. Um, we've covered a lot this tracks tab, but this tab is also quite good. So this tab shows you the different sequences that are in the genome, um, eight, eight chromosomes in the mitochondrial genome, and the number of annotations we currently have on those in Apollo. And then um, downloading it, it's very, very easy. So there's, for instance, a GFF format you could. Um, I'm now selecting here this chromosome one. Um, and then you can either download just the GFF file, um, the annotation, or both GFF3 and FASTA. And you just click on it and you say export and then you get all of the annotations that are on this chromosome um, or you can use this here um, if you're interested in the um, peptides and in the amino acid sequence or the dna sequence you can of course download that as well um, yeah or um, alternatively if you're interested in functional annotation so this can also be done in apollo um, you can download um, different formats on how to download Go terms. So very, very easy. Everyone we can go in and download it. If you're only interested in one gene, you can, of course, go in and just say with the right click, get sequence, and then you've got the sequence, either peptide, or you can also um, the DNA sequence download. So yeah, fairly easy. And, Uli, is there a way to... Um only identify or download the genes that are novel, that are not in the official annotation, but have been added to Apollo? Um, no, not with this. Um, you okay. would just get all of them that are present in Apollo. So you wouldn't yes. get all of the genes, but just the genes that were annotated in Apollo. So that uh, might okay. Yeah, so they okay. might not be new, but there will be different maybe, or they will have function annotation added. So something has been done to them in Apollo. So you don't get everything. You get just the genes that are here in the user created annotations track. Yeah. And then um, some people assign attributes to them, so you can extract that. Um, so for instance, I say assign attributes and say, this is a new gene. Um, so, for instance, this one here is a new gene. If I open the annotation, I'm good to show you. I usually have um, an attribute and say new. So you could extract if you're only interested in novel ones. Okay. Oh, great. That's very nice. That's very good. Um, so there was a, qu a question from, from Lois about um, how much do those new annotations affect any kind of analysis, like RNA sequence analysis? And, and yeah, I mean, that really depends. I mean, so so um, obviously when you're running the analysis through Galaxy, what you are using is the official gene annotation and not the Apollo modifications. Uh, the Apollo modifications will not be part of the official annotation until you know we reach a threshold of, of different gene models or, or different annotations. And then we sort of do a bulk um, reload and, and of that genome. And we try and uh, our goal is to make sure we are in sync with GenBank. So if we update our genome with the new annotation, that we also update those in, in GenBank. So there isn't like two versions of the genome out there. Um, how much will that affect um, uh, your RNA sequence analysis really depends on how, um, I guess, how bad is the, the official annotation? Um, you know, if there are gonna be hundreds of new genes annotated, um, then in theory, it's gonna affect it dramatically. Um, if genes were just modified by adding UTRs, I don't think this will change your main conclusions. I would be surprised if adding the UTRs will, will change your main conclusions if the gene models were there. Um, it could presumably if you have some genes with very long UTRs and for some reason there's a lot of reads that are mapping to the UTRs, but I think in general it, it should not affect your, your main conclusion if, if the gene models are, are fairly good overall. Hopefully that answers your, your question, Lois. But I think in general, uh, you don't necessarily have to always have the latest annotation because the annotation may only have like a 
an addition of a couple of genes, of course, of course, there may be a chance that one of those two new genes were the, the, the important genes were super expressed. But then you can always look at your RNA-seq mapping and see where the reads fall and see if there's a new gene annotated in that region, right? And then that can give you an idea and you can say, okay, well, maybe I need to somehow include that gene in my analysis and, and, and go back and, and redo some, some things, but yeah. So there's a question um, that one cannot see any new gene models in PlasmaDB. There are new, no new gene models. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a simple, simple reason why you can't see them because there aren't any new ones. So, <laughs> so the, the Plasmodium falciparum uh, in particular and other of the plasma genomes are, are, are very, very well annotated. Um, and so, you know, there may be some new gene models that could be discovered, but I think in general, uh, there are just, probably one of the better annotated genomes out there, if I have to guess. A lot of it is thanks to Uli, by the way, who, who's, who's one of our expert annotators, so, so we can thank her. Or blame her for if there's a mistake, you can do that too. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, let's go ahead and um, switch to my sharing. Okay. So, um, all right. So we only have a couple more things to cover. Uh, we're obviously running a little bit late, but I think we can we can squeeze a couple of things in. We always have that free time in the end, so maybe we'll use that up completely for the exercises. Um, so one thing that we definitely want to touch on is uh, phenotypic data in view of DB resources, and so. Uh, I'm not going to have a broad, a big lecture. I'm just going to speak very broadly about uh, about phenotypic data, and um, depending on the resource, we may have different types of phenotypic data, and that often depends on whether um, the organism is accessible to a particular uh, technology, or uh, or if that that if that ex oops, if that experiment was uh, what happened here. Let's see, there we go. Um, so let's go back here. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to go to TriTripDB, for example, and any of the resources. You can go in and look under a, a um, section called phenotype, and so we have searches for phenotypic evidence. And depending on the, again, as I mentioned, the organism, you might find different types of phenotypic evidence. So, for example, in TriTripDB, there's a whole genome RNAi experiment, and so you can, and depending on the type of data, you will search the data in different ways. So this in particular was an, essentially was an RNA sequence experiment after induction of whole genome RNAi, uh, R, you know, RNA interference. And so you're basically saying, I wanna find genes and it's, it's by, it's, you only can select decreased coverage, right? So basically what they did is they induced RNAi uh, in different stages um, and then um, sequenced. And then if a particular, um, uh, gene was not expressed, then um, it it was targeted basically in that particular sample. And if it disappears, um, then it, it's potentially um, essential. So decreased coverage would potentially indicate a gene that is important because it's it's missing from the um, from the samples basically. Um, and so, bottom line is you can select a sample and can say, well, I want to find genes that are um, compared to uninduced are, uh, that are disappearing from a particular condition. Um, and then when you do this, um, you will get the genes that come back that met that criteria. And then you can sort them and decide, you know, which ones are important. We provide um, some graphs. Um, let me go down here, close this. Um, and so we have some graphs here. So for example, for this experiment, we show each of the stages that were that were used in the experiment, and the red dot signifies your gene where it falls in the um, in the induction um, uh, uh, graph. In this case, so expression values basically, and you can see that this is decreased dramatically in um, in in all of them. But it's also this one seems to be low in the in the in the wild type. But then you can see other ones where it's higher in the wild type and lower in the mutants and in the in the in induced stages and so forth. Um, so so that's one type of data which relies on, on RNA sequence data. 
Um, I'm going to go to, well, let's say in TriTripDB, we have another type of data in TriTripDB as well, also in GRDDB, where you can look for subcellular localization. It's phenotype essentially because you're looking at um, GFP expression, um, but but we categorize it under subcellular localization. So if we just do localization, you'll see cellular localization imaging. So I can go in here and, and what this group did, there's a, there's a trip tag project from uh, Richard Wheeler's group. They basically tagged every single gene in the genome C terminally or N terminally with a fluorescent protein. Um, and so I can go in and say, find me genes that are uh, C terminally tagged that are um, you know, let's see, and, and we use Go terms to categorize um, the um, uh, the description of these of these proteins. Um, they actually use Go terms, so it's very nice. So it makes it easy for us to integrate. And so we have, uh, for example, if I want to look for cilium, and I can ask for any genes that were localized to the cilium based on um, the Go term. There are about two thousand, and you get some information here, including images, which you can. Um, look at more closely, um, both on um, on the G page right here. So you'll see there's a section which shows you the localization. Then here you can quickly see what the localization looked like, both from the N terminal and the C terminal side. You can zoom in on these and, and look at them and, and see some quite nice images of the parasites and the protein of interest. Um, OK, let me jump quickly to ToxoD. I'm just going to give you a whirlwind of different types of phenotypic data sets that are available. So in ToxoDB, a, a couple of data sets that I think are quite useful to think about. Um, and, uh, and one is the CRISPR data, which I think we, we actually did already as, a, as an example, but it's the CRISPR phenotype. And again, they, based on their, um, their experiment, they basically CRISPRed all the, G, the entire genome, and then they uh, did a, some kind of a growth assay, and then they determined for each gene that was knocked out, um, what is its relative growth rate? And then they assigned it a, a particular score. And you can see in the bottom here, they have a graph representing all the genes in the genome, where to fall on their fitness score. And they have some example marker genes. So you can look and see you know, where some of these genes fall. And then when you run a search, you can see where your genes of interest fall in this graph or, or select genes of a particular interest. So for example, you can say, well, I only want to find genes that are between minus six and minus 6.89, so severely affecting fitness. And so when you run the search, you get um, 28 genes. And then if you scroll down and look at them, um, you can look at the, the, the scores. Um, and then each gene will have a graph on the gene page in the phenotype section, which represents um, the, um, where it falls in the CRISPR score. And so it shouldn't be surprising that this gene is all the way at the bottom, because that's what we selected um, compared to all the other genes in the, in the genome. Um, another type of data as well, that's whole genome. Uh, again, this is a, a cellular localization um, um, uh, um, experiment. And what they did in this case, they, um, they ran a search for, uh, well, they, it's a proteomic experiment. So what they did, uh, but the output is not what we're, what we're showing you here is not the actual proteomics data, but their conclusions from the proteomics data. So what they did is they um, fractioned uh, toxoplasma uh, cells, um, and then they uh, did proteomics on them, and then they clustered the proteins that they brought out from this proteomics, and they used marker proteins that are known to target to particular locations to define and, and describe the clusters that they found. And so right here on the right-hand side, these are all the clusters, basically. And so, for example, if you're looking for uh, genes that are potentially in the inner membrane complex, you can select this. And the probability is, is usually very straightforward. It's like zero or, or one or very close to one. And so, um, so I almost never see anything in between here. And so you can just go ahead and select everything with a high probability. Um, this filtering, when you filter here, it tells you it's going to come back with 82 genes out of the um, uh, 3,832 genes that they had evidence for. And when you run this, this will give you um, those results. So these are 82 genes that are potentially in the inner membrane complex that are that are interesting. And and nice thing is that you will you will find things in here that that make sense, which is which is good because you want to see that. Um, and so you know genes involved in gliding, for example, and uh, myosin, which are all all definitely 
uh, LDR. So all definitely uh, present in the uh, in the membrane complex of, of the parasite. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump to fungi DB. And so if we go under phenotype, um, you will notice there'll be a variety of, um, of uh, searches available to you. Um, so, uh, and some of them are uh, labeled as curated. And so for example, we import all curated phenotypes from another database called Phibase. And it shows you that these are all the organisms represented in Phibase, there are many. Um, there are some manually curated phenotypes that are annotators integrated. Um, there's um, some uh, screening phenotypes, uh, for example, for, for Canada and there's the Rospera from the image collection. Um, and so, and, and these will, <coughs> will vary a little bit in, in, in terms of how you uh, search them. But for example, if I go to this one, I can go in and it'll give you all the, um, the, inf the um, sample descriptions that were provided by the, the group that did this analysis over, over many years. And so, I, for example, I can, um, I don't know, let's pick, um, you know, ones that had abnormal or had no conidia. I don't know, let's, let's pick that. Um, so we should get 14 results back, I think, or, or three genes out of 14 samples maybe. Um, and so you can look at those and now if I notice these are three genes, but they're four transcripts, right? So one of these genes has two transcripts. You'll notice it has the same gene ID, but the transcript ID is ends in dash one or underscore one underscore two. Um, so we can pick, um, I don't know, let's pick one of these. And then here, if you go to the phenotype section, I always, whenever I see that a gene has a user, user comment, that's almost sometimes one of the first things I do is I go and look at the user comment and see if it's if it's anything useful. Um, and you could see that this is, um, you know, this guy Jesus Bedolla uh, provided this, and he provided a bunch of PubMed IDs that are associated with this gene, right? So, so then I would be potentially interested in looking at these papers. So that's quite nice. Um, let's look at the phenotype section. Uh, and then you'll notice there are different types of phenotypes here, but here's the results from, from this experiment and you can see the actual images. You can see their mor the morphology and their physiology that they recorded and also the images of the, of the, 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 the fungo fungi and, and the way they, they were growing or not growing and so forth. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's pretty useful. Um, I think this is all I was going to say about phenotype data. The bottom line is that there are different, many different types of phenotype data that we can integrate and they're available and they may not be available for your organism specifically, but remember that you can leverage orthology and you can ask, well, show me the genes that are localized in the inner membrane complex of toxoplasma and show me now the orthologs in um, you know, Imeria or, or Plasmodium, because you're interested in that. And, and by analogy, you hope that they're potentially in the same compartment. Same thing with in fungi DB, you can ask for questions in, in Neurospora and then maybe ask if, if they're um, Aspergillus um, homologs that are potentially interesting to look at based on the phenotype that this was described in uh, Neurospora. Okay, this is all I was going to talk about phenotypes. Anybody else wanted to mention anything else from the instructors, or are there any any questions? Maybe just a quick mention that if uh, someone is working on the large scale um, annotation for genes, especially when it comes to phenotypes, we do offer a few forms that offer a controlled vocabulary and also examples of how you can use Go terms, Chebby IDs, and um, um, other ontologies to annotate phenotypes. And you can submit submit this data to us, uh, which we will work on integrating into the structured searches within the ViewBathDB database. And this data is available if you go to About Us, how to submit data and scroll down all the way to the bottom of the page to view the forms. Yeah. Yeah. Rather, bulk user um, phenotype collection form. And if you click at the very last link at the bottom, 
uh, you will expand into two different forms. Once there's parasite specific and one is there's fungi specific simply because they're using different type of um, uh, ontologies and uh, terms. That's it, thanks. Cool, and I, I got to restart Firefox. <laughs> So I hate that about Firefox. It forces you to restart. So anyway, well, we'll leave it at that for now. I'll restart. There we go. So um, let's go ahead and um, so uh, first of all, I guess, are there any any questions from attendees? OK, cool. So. Um, what I would suggest is we go into breakout rooms and maybe spend just half an hour in the breakout rooms exploring some of the phenotypic data. My recommendation is just to go in and, and try one of these, maybe two of these searches uh, and just, you know, get just become familiar with how um, you can run these searches and integrate them in your in your searches. So so I think we we do the, um, uh, the sub localization data and track trip TB. Uh, I mentioned that there are C terminal and N terminal fusions. You know, you obviously have to keep that in mind. You know, if you if you fuse a protein, uh, a fluorescent marker to a protein on the on the N terminus, and you block a signal peptide, for example, then the protein is no longer going to be secreted, and you're going to get a viscal localization. So that's what's always good to look at uh, both uh, localizations. Um, and then we'll do the CRISPR one, and I think that's there may be another one in here. But if we get to uh, both of these, yeah, Plasmodium has piggyback mutagenesis analysis, which is a whole genome analysis. Uh, so yeah, so I'd recommend that you try a couple of these, um, and then we'll come back in half an hour. So let's go ahead and go out to our breakout rooms. <laughs> 